Artemis and Apollo with Poppy Northcutt. Welcome back to the Cosmic Companion. This week, we're going to discuss the return of humans to the moon with NASA's Artemis program and compare today's endeavors to the Apollo program of the 1960s and early 70s. Later on, we're going to be joined by Apollo mathematician Poppy Northcutt. She was the first woman to work at NASA Mission Control and was instrumental to the success of Apollo 8 and the safe return of Apollo 13. The first flight in the Artemis program, not surprisingly named Artemis 1, will be the sole uncrewed flight in the Artemis program. Although later missions will bring human travelers back to the moon, this first flight is fully automated. The spacecraft will soar beyond the orbit of the moon before returning back to Earth. This flight path brings Orion on a similar trajectory to that followed by the Apollo 8 mission of December 1968. The launch vehicle comprising the Space Launch System is now largely assembled and is expected to roll out to the launch pad in the middle of March for tests. Artemis 1 will mark the first flight of the SLS, as well as the second flight of the Orion space capsule, which will soon carry astronauts to the moon. Once launched, booster rockets will separate from the launch vehicle and the Orion spacecraft, along with a service module and attached rocket engine, will spend 90 minutes orbiting Earth testing systems. The ICPS booster will then fire, pushing the capsule into a higher 42-hour orbit around our planet before heading off on a trip around the moon. Launch of Artemis 1 is currently expected to take place no earlier than May, although that date could slip until June or July. Tentatively scheduled to lift off in 2024, Artemis 2 will bring humans beyond low Earth orbit for the first time since the early 1970s. Woo-hoo! This mission will test flight systems with a crew of four astronauts on board, a critical step to returning human travelers to the lunar surface on the following flight. Now, similar to the flight of Apollo 8, the crew of Artemis 2 will pass behind the moon as seen from Earth during this critical mission. Following their flight over the far side of the moon, the pull of Earth's gravity will bring the astronauts back home to our terra firma. Looking deep into the universe, we see backwards in time. And the oldest light in the universe holds secrets to how everything around us will, one day, end. Meanwhile, stars, planets, and galaxies dance in an intricate ballet, occasionally giving birth to life. We are a fledgling species, just beginning to visit other worlds. We are a way for the universe to understand itself. The Cosmic Companion strives to bring the universe down to Earth and we depend on your help to make it happen. For information on subscriptions and ways to donate to this program, please visit thecosmiccompanion.net. Thank you. This week on The Cosmic Companion, we are delighted to be joined by Poppy Northcutt. She was the first female engineer at NASA's Mission Control, and she's been a lifelong advocate for the rights of women in Texas, bless you, and beyond throughout the country. Welcome to the show, Poppy. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. 
Yeah. So give us a give us a look. What what brought you into a life of science? What started you down that road? Largely accident, to be honest. Um, I majored in mathematics at the time. Uh, you know, women that had college degrees basically were expected to do one of three things: either be a school teacher, a nurse, or maybe an executive secretary. So I actually figured I would end up being a, a math teacher. Uh, but when I finished school, I started looking around. Computers were just really coming into into play. I had taken a, a computer science course while I was in college. So I thought, you know, doing something not teaching would be more interesting. Uh, and I went looking for a job, and I ended up at a contractor for NASA at TRW Systems. Wow. And then how did then you were brought on through uh, into the Apollo program during the early days? How did that come about? Well, uh, that's what we were working on from the beginning of when I went there. The, the um, task that I was working on was the development of what was called the Return to Earth Program, hmm. which was uh, an analytic math model uh, to bring, you know, to do the targeting to bring the astronauts back to the Earth. Uh, you know, from Earth orbit, initially, you know, that was the very first part of it, and then the bigger part of it was to do the targeting from lunar orbit. So can you take us back to the time, to the days of planning Apollo 8? Uh, how are you best able to see the best return trajectory for, for the mission? Well, we had developed this math model uh, you know, the challenge is that you, you need to be able to uh, minimize fuel in some instances, and in some instances you may need to minimize time, or you may need to make a trade-off. It, it really depends on the circumstance that you're in. The program I worked on was initially called the abort program. Uh, they sort of changed the name of it for PR reasons <laughs> because they felt that calling it the abort program cast doubt on, you know, the fact that they were going to be able to do this, that if you had a whole program that was just about aborts, it sounded a little more dangerous than they wanted it to sound. But that was basically the challenge was that to have a program that you could use not just to plan a nominal mission, but that could handle whatever came up, uh, you know, and, and could calculate fast enough uh, that it would be effective. The, the real key to understanding what was going on at that time is that they had no onboard capability to do a return to Earth. They had no onboard capability to do any kind of major maneuvers uh, calculation. You know, the... the uh, Onboard computer was a marvel for its time, but it wasn't that marvelous. <laughs> so all of those major maneuvers were calculated in the control set, and then they were read up uh, to uh, to the crew. Uh, every, and and the, part of the challenge with eight in particular is that. The, the moon had not actually been mapped fully at that time. Mm. And uh, there's mass concentrations that affect the orbit. So, uh, you know, the predictions going in, they were off, okay, because of the mass concentrations. So that first lunar mission, which was eight, we were having to read up and do, you know, plan for an abort every orbit, okay? Um, in fact, two aborts every orbit. We were sending up one for the next pass behind the moon as well as the pass behind that, lest there was a loss of communication, you know, because, you know, they do the maneuver behind the moon. So that meant that it was, it was a perpetual hurry up and wait situation. Um, they would go behind the moon and you're just sitting there waiting for them to come out 
they get tracking. It takes a few minutes for the tracking data to come in. And then you're just scurrying like crazy to get the new calculations up and then, you know, to the Capcom and so forth, and then read up to them before they go back behind the moon the next time. And that went on for every orbit that, that they did on Apollo 8. It was really exhausting. Now, once they had mass concentrations mapped on the future missions, we weren't having to do that. Uh, they, they always had a return to Earth in their pocket, so to speak, but we weren't having to read up multiple maneuvers every rep. Uh, uh, that's incredible. You must have been waiting with bated breath to, as, they, as they came, waiting for them to come back around from the backside, huh? Every time, and especially after the lunar orbit insertion, because, you know, you, they do that maneuver on the backside of the moon, you don't know what happened. And if they overburned, for example, you could be on a collision course with the moon and have very little time to correct. And like I said, they don't have, they didn't have onboard capability for these things. So, you know, it was true white knuckle time, especially when they did lunar orbit insertion. And they were late coming out. Um, those, it, they were only maybe eight or 10 seconds late. It's not a big, it, you know, it's not a huge amount, except those were the longest few seconds I've ever been through. Uh, you know, they're calling out to them and they're not responding. And, uh, you know, you just don't know what has happened. Uh, and of course, when they do the, the trans earth injection, you have a similar situation. They're doing the burn behind the moon, you don't have communication. And so you're very, very nervous until you get the tracking data when they come out. What what excites you most about Artemis One? Well, just the whole prospect of going back to the moon excites me. Uh, I thought it was such a disappointment that we didn't carry out the, the entirety of what had been planned for the Apollo series. Uh, you know, because we didn't we didn't fully explore the moon. We didn't go into high inclination orbits, you know, land up, up in those higher inclination areas. We didn't go polar. We didn't do anything on the backside of the moon. Uh, you know, it's like we, we spent all this money on the front end and all of this effort to, to get there and then just packed it in, which made no sense to me um, and was very disappointing. I, you know, when when Apollo 8 flew, I had visions of us ending up with, uh, you know, uh, an outpost on the moon and going on to Mars. In fact, I did some early work on Mars missions. So mainly I'm just excited that we're going back, wow. even if it is 50 years later. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, of course, after Artemis 1 comes Artemis 2, and then Artemis, the big one, Artemis 3, where we place, place human beings back, back on the moon again, including the first woman and the first person of color. Um, how do you see space exploration uh, furthering women's rights and rights of traditionally repressed people? Well, it, it mainly is just opening opportunities up in, in science and technology and, and letting people know that space is for everybody. Uh, science and technology is for everybody, uh, you know, White men do not have an exclusive, you know, set of skills in that area. Uh, there's a lot more brain power out there. And for us to do all of the things that we can do, we need to be able to tap into all of it, not just this limited sector. And um, now, as we go on and explore space further and have colonies and, you know, habitats on the moon and on Mars... I mean, space is hard. It's, Very hard. It's, it's a tough place to live. It's a tough place to get to. And so it seems to me, looking to the future, like, you know, we're going to be in a future where everyone's going to be depending on everyone else for pure yes. survival. 
doesn't matter what your gender is, your race, your creed, your nationality, or who built the gosh darn dome that's protecting you right now. You know, do you, do you, I'm just curious whether we will see discrimination and of all sorts uh, fade over time as we expand out beyond our planetary cradle. I have no idea about that. I mean, you know, people take their biases with them. So, you know, if they have those biases on the planet Earth, they're going to take them with them. Uh, But, you know, just working with people of more diverse backgrounds begins to to lower some of those things. Uh, So eventually I hope it'll go away. But, you know, people have been experiencing bias for thousands of years okay we're a tribal we're tribal creatures to be honest uh, and uh, we we still function that way hmm. that's a good point um for the first generation i i I think I have some hope, maybe false optimism that over the course of several generations that, you know, a third generation Martian isn't going to put a lot of um, weight into, uh, isn't going to find much import into, into the petty squabbles of nations on Earth. That may be true, but they may come up with their own tribalism. Mm-hmm. Their own version of tribal. <laughs> I mean, maybe it will be the insiders who are on Mars versus the outsiders. Yeah, you know, um, <laughs> I wish I was more optimistic than that. But I, I, as I said, I think we we carry some of these things with it with us. I think some of it may, some of the uh, tendencies may just be human tendencies to be tribal. Hmm, that's fascinating. And so, finally, what's what's next? In, what's next for you? What's what's happening? What's happening now in the life of Poppy Northcutt? Well, I'm very politically engaged. I'm a voter registrar in Texas, and I'm also uh, an election judge. So uh, we have elections coming up. You know, so I'm out registering voters fairly often these days, or, or I'm out training working on the upcoming election. I worked on an election earlier this week. I'm still recovering because you work an extremely long day. It's Mm -hmm. as bad as being in mission control in terms of the length of the day, okay? Uh, Actually, even worse. I thought it was bad to be working 13-hour shifts in the control center. But uh, this last election on Tuesday, I got there at 5.30, and I left at 10 o'clock at night. Wow. So... (laughs) <laughs> that's, that's, that's a long day. Very long day, and I'm, yeah. you know, I don't have the recovery time I had when I was in my twenties. So uh, I'm, I'm still a little groggy, trying to catch up on sleep. All right, well, we'll let you get some sleep then. Thanks so much for being on the show, Poppy. It was great talking with you. Pleasure to be here. Uh, Like Apollo 11 during the summer of 69, the astronauts touching down on the moon will make history. Originally scheduled for 2024, Artemis 3 is now expected to launch in 2025 or possibly the following year. Now, astronauts will take off from Earth aboard the mighty SLS booster rocket traveling to lunar orbit aboard an Orion spacecraft. The space launch system propelling the Artemis flights are powered by four RS-25 main engines originally manufactured for the space shuttle. Together with a pair of shuttle solid rocket boosters, Artemis will lift off with a total of 8.8 million pounds of thrust 15% more than the Saturn V rocket used for Apollo. Following their flight to our planetary neighbor, the crew will then transfer to a SpaceX Starship, which will ferry the intrepid explorers to the surface of the moon. Included in the landing crew will be the 
first woman to ever touch the down on the lunar surface. Woohoo! Following a week exploring the moon, the crew will board Starship once Starship once again, bringing them back to the Orion vehicle, which will then ferry the crew back home to Earth. The crew for this historic mission is yet to be named. Woohoo! Now, following Artemis 3, the first two components of the Lunar Gateway will arrive in orbit above the moon, delivered by a SpaceX Falcon rocket. Falcon 9 rocket, this relatively small space station orbiting the moon will offer future travelers a stopping off point during journeys to our planetary companion. The four person crew of Artemis 4 will journey to this gateway space station, bringing the IHAB habitation module from the Japanese space and European space agencies to the far flung outpost. Artemis V would be NASA's second attempt to land humans on the moon, becoming the first flight to land utilizing the lunar gateway. However, that mission is not expected to take place until 2027 or possibly 2028. And the Artemis program is gonna help us open up a new era in human habitation of the moon. Over the course of decades, our species will learn to live on other worlds, including Mars. After millions of years of evolution, we may finally become an interplanetary species. Hello. Thanks for joining us, and we hope you can visit with us again real soon. Come take a look at the CosmicCompanion.tv or check us out on, all, on your favorite, even your least favorite social media outlet. So take a look at Facebook Talk to Ground. You'll find us. As a special bonus for watching until the end of the show, here's a picture of Maxwell Smart Caddington Maynard Hennig, the executive producer of our show, checking out the new studio. He's pretty young, cute, huh? Anyway, here's wishing the crews of Artemis as well as everyone out there clear skies.